morning. Good morning. Uh, it's Thursday already. And we're into plastics with um, Brad Braden. Brad? Yeah. yeah. Welcome. Sure. Really, my name's George. Okay. Uh, that's my dad's name, too. Um, thanks for having me. My name's Brad Braddon. It's really George Braddon. And uh, my family owned a business that made uh, polystyrene foam meat trays for 37 years and uh, recently sold that business to Technoplex. And so now I work for Technoplex and I work in the engineering department. I'm in charge of the engineering for the um, Dalco business unit and we make um, foam egg cartons and we make uh, polystyrene foam trays and few, few take up containers. And uh, you know one of the things I've kind of been hearing a lot lately is geez, you know, your family makes that foam packaging, that stuff's terrible. You know, well, I can't believe you should be ashamed of yourself. And I'm like, what? No, I'm the opposite. I'm proud to make that. I don't know where you come up with that. And so I think that sometimes the common knowledge uh, isn't always right, and sometimes you gotta, uh, you know, step back and take a take a look and, and see, well, kind of what the what the truth might really be. And one of the things I hear is that it's dangerous, and uh, I can tell you it's not. I mean, we um, uh, have a food safety program, and uh, it starts with the Global Food Safety Initiative, where a group of uh, people got together and they they kind of wrote the gold standard for. Uh, safe packaging for food, and then uh, an association called the Bre British Retail Consortium, they wrote a standard, so that if you follow this standard, then you then you meet this gold this gold standard by GFSI Global Food Safety Initiative. And then the third part is that you have a company come in and inspect your process, and they look at all your processes, all your records, they look at your facility, and uh, we hire uh, AIG for that international. Association of International Bakers, and uh, they were created to make packaging safe. And so we score an A rating on this gold standard for food safety so I can assure you that it's safe. Um, there are no CFCs, I've heard, I, I hear there's CFCs that are not. Uh, people talk about benzene, benzene, it shouldn't be confused with polystyrene, that's a styrene issue. Styrene looks like epoxy. It's a thick liquid, um, polystyrene is a solid uh, polymer, it's a polymer, it's, it's uh, organic chemistry. Um, and uh, and it, doesn't, it doesn't break into little pieces, that, that's like foam coolers, if you bust a foam cooler and you're stuffing your, you, you get all these pieces, you don't, you don't really get that with them. So that's sort of, you know, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily the case. And then I'm assuming that a bill like this, the intent is to have a lower impact on the environment. And I'll tell you, passing a bill like this will have exactly the opposite effect of that. Of, of that. And I'll tell you why. You've taken the most efficient product from a material standpoint, and a, and a, a ban on that would get you materials that are less efficient which means that you would need more facilities to make um, plastic. For example, um, these are both polystyrene number six. If I were to make both of these in my plant, I would take the raw materials from the same box, literally the same box. There's no difference in the materials of these. This one's been foamed, this one has not. It's a little bit like soap in the bathroom. Right, if you ban the foaming soap, and now you had to use the liquid soap, you'd use twice as much. You'd need twice as much many facilities to make liquid soap as you do now. So my point would be, if, you're, if, if the bill bans this, and we're substituting this, we're going to be building facilities to make plastic pellets, because you're going to need more. And it gets worse when you look at you know, look at something like this. This is from the Big M next door. They sell chili in this. It's 4.6, 4. this is all made of energy. All plastic is made of energy. It's either oil or natural gas. So when you use more, you're using more fossil fuels. So if you want to use more fossil fuels, then, 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 then that's, that's what the, I, I believe that's what the bill would do. So here you go, 4.6, the lid's 1.8. That's uh, under six grams. Here's, here's a substitute container. 
the lid alone, forget about this, the lid alone has more environmental impact than, than, than this entire container. Look at this is 6.8 grams. This is 4.6, So, you know, and this, this isn't real, this isn't recyclable either. Are we recycling these? I don't think so. They've got a layer of polyethylene in them. So you're not recycling that either. They're going to the same place. You have more environmental impact. Here's another substitute product. This is 10.7 plus 4.3. So easily double the environmental impact of that. If you need one facility to make enough of these, you need two facilities to make enough of these. If, if these bans continue to be widespread, you're gonna see facilities being built to make plastic. That's what you're gonna see. Here's an interesting one. Uh, this kind of makes the point. So, by the way, it is recyclable. This is this is ground up foam, and then this is what it looks like when we reprocess it and we reuse all of it. By the way, some of these products, if they're crystalline in nature, you won't you won't reuse all the trim scrap. So you get a huge amount of scrap coming out of these factories. Should it, should it go that way? So this is the amount of plastic it takes to make this one foam tray. Not very much, right? That's pretty environmentally efficient. I'd say we're winning on that. Uh, this is what it takes to make the substitute. Three, three times as much. And uh, this, is a, this is arguably a hold more pork chops than this, right? And I don't know why it's going this direction. It makes me nuts. Um, this is a foam tray. I cut a little piece out of it just to show. You know, I put this in, I went down to the machine shop and I put it in a vise and I left it clamped there. And I forced all the air out of that. And so I had a 95% reduction in thickness from 242 thousandths to 13. So my point is if this is under 100 feet of stuff in a landfill, it's going to look more like this than like this. And I see bit of these bills that say 30% of the landfill is this stuff. Uh-uh. I and mean, I looked at the Vermont statistics and I think it was all plastic was 13%. And, 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 and I'm going from memory, that might be, might be wrong. And then, and then polystyrene was like 15% of that. So it came out to be under 1% of the landfill of this stuff. So, and that's from, the, that's from the Vermont DEC website. So it's not quite as terrible as it looks. And then, you know, here's a good example. This is what we do. This is a, this is a foam egg carton at 14.9 grams. And um, some people think this is, a, this is a better container for the environment. I don't know why they think that, because it's... 47 grams. So it's easily three times the, the environmental impact uh, to go from this to this. And, and, and people like it better. So my, my point is I think there's some issues with uh, kind of what the common knowledge is saying about this stuff. And I think we need to be careful with a, with a, with a passing a bill that would have the opposite of effects from an environmental point of view. You're going to use a lot more plastic. And if, you're, and if the goal is to re reduce cost, I mean, really, I don't think, I don't think any of these are, is any of this stuff profitable to recycle? Is anything profitable to recycle? I mean, we know glass isn't. Is this stuff? I mean, this gets picked on, not profitable to recycle. Well, is any of this stuff profitable to recycle? I don't think it is, but I don't, I don't know. And I got my thing. So, you know, if, if from the, thank you, from the municipality's point of view, we're, we're, we're stuck paying for end of life, right? And that's a cost, and, 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 we're, and we'd like to reduce that cost. Well, we pay based on weight. So if the bill bans this, you're gonna get this, you're gonna be paying more. It's gonna cost the taxpayers more, it's gonna cost the municipality more, it's not, not good for the people of Vermont. And uh, I got some more stuff, but yeah, I think we get to go to questions. What is the process to make the foam container versus the okay. clear one? What is the actual process? There's okay, yeah, there's a couple different these, this one's being PET, this one's being polystyrene. The uh, the PET comes through a, a flat die and it just comes out yay thick. The polystyrene comes out through a die like that and then they stretch it this way and they stretch it this way and they tend to get some different 
properties, but it's coming out of a flat die as a solid. The, the foam container has a gas injected into the um, extrusion process and the gas will dissolve into the plastic like sugar dissolves in coffee. And then what it, is that gas? The gas in this case is butane. It's sometimes it's CO2, sometimes it's nitrogen. 100 years ago it was Freon, not 100, I'm exaggerating, 50 years ago it was Freon. That's where the CFCs came from. That's been uh, illegal for a long time. Um, this, then this comes out of a round die like this. And when it comes out, there's a big temperature drop and pressure drop. And so what happens is, because you're inside the extruder at 2,000 PSI, you come out of the extruder, you're at atmospheric. And what happens is, all of the uh, gas that you use comes out of solution and it forms a bunch of tiny little cells. Over time, the, the gas in those cells is replaced with the um, air that's in the room. And you use, um, for, a, for, a, for a 10 pound um, case of school lunch trays, the, the amount of um, butane that would be in there would, would, would be about this much. So you're taking this much butane to reduce this much plastic. And that's and that's really the that's why that's why this is so environmentally friendly is this, because it takes half the plastic away. So then what is the bad part of that? This? Yeah. I don't know. You got me. <laughs> that's I don't, what I'm trying to figure out. I, I don't know what it is. I, I'm, I'm confused by that. I think it's unpopular and a lot of people don't like it. They don't know why they don't like it, but they don't like it and I think we feel obligated to do something about that. I mean, that's why that's why these that's why these bands come up is because people in leadership they feel they have a responsibility to address the issues that the public is bringing up. And people <coughs> don't they don't like this. They don't know why they don't like it. I ask them all the time, you know, and and they don't know. And, and well, we did take testimony that it is the butane is toxic and that it's carcinogenic. Uh, the benzene. Benzene. Well, the, 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 yeah, the, the, but the, the benzene is, uh, is styrene and not, not polystyrene. What, so, 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 what, so a, a monomer is a, is a, a styrene is a chain length of one. A polymer is, are these really long chains and then when they connect, then you, it's like the difference between hydrogen in uh, an atmosphere of oxygen is very dangerous and you're concerned about that. But if you have H2O, that's water. And we're no longer concerned about the hydrogen in the presence of oxygen. It's no longer explosive when it's not two gases but water. And that's the difference between a, a monomer of styrene and a polymer of polystyrene. It's similar in that regard. I think, I think that, you know, there's a lot of questions around this. It isn't as cut and dry. It isn't it's bad, we should ban it. You know, if you think it's bad, study it, right? I mean, study it, understand it. Do the working group or you do the ban so that, you're, so that you have the facts behind you, you know, and you can answer those questions and, you know, use data. Any other questions? Um, so the a significant number, I think, of food service, uh, hospitalities will have your takeout in a exact copy of that one, only it's it's paper. Paper. And 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 um, how do those how do the paper ones stack up environmentally um, for for maybe the full life? You know what? I have a I have a pretty in depth knowledge of the plastic part. Of it. I've just been around it. That's your business. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and we built our own equipment. And so when we sold that equipment, so I would go to these shows and I would see and talk to plastics people, be members of these associations. I know paper I don't really know. Um, but um, I was, uh, recently I was with a, a guy at GenPack named Ed Ryder, and he was telling me that they did put in some molded fiber plants to do what you're talking about. They have one in the United States and they work with a couple in China. And he was telling me that they had a thousand horsepower motor on this machine. And he says, side by side, you're, you're making uh, 1,800 cases a day of the polystyrene and, and, one, and 180 of the molded fiber. He was talking just about a tremendous 
amount of electricity. And you don't, like these are made of energy, they're still made of energy. The paper, the energy is consumed through heat. And they use these giant, I, I was through a molded fiber plant in Argentina, and the thing, the, the oven was 20 feet wide and 100 feet long, and it was hot in there, and it smelled bad too. So, I mean, I don't think that, I, I, I don't think paper is a better, is environmentally, more environmentally friendly. I don't know why people think that. It's not my opinion. I don't think paper is a better alternative to plastic. That's my opinion. Where is your plant? We're in uh, Bloomfield, New York. So it's a little town of about 4,000. We're south of Rochester. And that's the plant that my father founded in 1981. And then we sold the Techaplex on May 1st of uh, 2018. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. For You're in. welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Good presentation, Thank you. Nice stuff. <laughs> like that reusable plastic bag. Like yeah. that. <laughs> Container Corporation, Government Affairs, and the Environment Committee. We make uh, food service products, anywhere between two to four thousand, depending on the time of the year. Um, everything from what was traditionally known as a Dunkin' Donuts coffee cup to red solo cup to plastic cups. They put ketchup in. Anything that's food service related, we, we probably have made something that you have had. And I'm here uh, today to talk about the benefits of um, expanded polystyrene. I just want to have a, a conversation. It's not us against you or you against us, it's just a conversation. Um, but we do make expanded polystyrene products, and most of those are um, taken back and recycled. There is no state in the United States yet that has banned expanded polystyrene because it keeps hot things hot, it keeps, keeps cold things cold, and even hospitals use it and hospitals use it to transplant organs in for organ transplant. So it's, it's a, a, a sterile product. There, since it's been on the market oh, since over 50 years, there's never been one health related issue related to expanded polystyrene. Sometimes people will conflate polystyrene with polystyrene. So styrene is a liquid. Expanded polystyrene is a solid. So one is a liquid, a monomer, when you put it together. And, and my background is in chemical engineering. So styrene is a liquid. Polystyrene is a solid. They have different chemical uh, characteristics and equations. So if, let's take salt for example, Na for sodium, Cl for chlorine. If you add sodium to water by itself, it will explode. You add chlorine to sodium, 
it'll make salt water. So there is a very distinct difference. And the same is true between styrene and polystyrene. So if there's any health issue related questions, I'll be happy to answer those. But the short answer is, is that there has never been one health related incident related to polystyrene out of a polystyrene cup. And polystyrene was invented primarily because the, the trains, they would use a ladle, they would drink water, and they would pass typhoid, and they would do all these other things. And, and so there needed to be a, uh, a, a, a delivery material that would uh, not pass bacteria or viruses uh, along. And, and so that's primarily why single service uh, cups were invented. So that's, that's, that's number one. Um, we, Dart as a company has been making expanded polystyrene for over 50 years. We're based in uh, Mason, Michigan. Two of our largest facilities are in uh, Leola, Pennsylvania, and Horsegate, Kentucky. We have manufacturing facilities in Maryland, and most of our distribution is done out of Maryland. And as many of you have may have read, um, Maryland, both the House and the Senate, has passed bills to ban expanded polystyrene. The, that, that bill has not been signed by the governor. We've talked to the governor. And similarly in Maine, uh, we are working with Governor Mills to express our concern of the efficacy of uh, polystyrene, expanded polystyrene. And they have carved out, in Maine especially, they're saying, oh, it's okay to ship lobsters in Maine, but you can't drink a cup of coffee out of expanded polystyrene. So if you're gonna pick winners and losers, let's make it fair. So in Maine, if the bill does get signed into law, which hasn't been done yet, it hasn't been presented to the governor, uh, we, our argument is, is that, why is it okay to ship a lobster in foam, but not okay to drink a cup of coffee out of foam? So that's, that's a distinction without a difference. In Maryland, they are willing to allow students to continue to eat food out of polystyrene trays, but they're not allowing the mom and pop stores that work on nickels and dimes at most to sell a cup of coffee out of a polystyrene cup. So if, if it's a health issue, make it a health issue. If it's a recyclability issue, let's talk about that, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and if, so you have health, recyclability, and landfill, and greenhouse gas, and environmental effects. So a foam cup takes less natural resources, less energy, less water, less power to make than a paper cup. And Starbucks has actually even tried to implement a paper cup recycling industry. But those hot paper cups are 10% lined with polyethylene. So any paper cup that you get, just like that one and that one 
it's 10% lined with polyethylene. And so they're not just paper. If you put a hot product in one of those cups, it'll leach through. So to get the pulp out of those uh, cups uh, will take intensive energy to melt the plastic off, to take it out, and then then and only then can you uh, recycle the paper that are in those cups. So it, it's, it's not as simple and as easy as people make it out to be. It, it's, it's much harder. And I'm not here to talk bad about paper or plastic or foam or compostable because our company, like I said, makes between two and 4,000 products depending on the time of the year. And a hot paper cup, we make those, we sell those, and they're harder to recycle. What we do in, in Maryland and Pennsylvania and other states are we have drop-offs where we recycle all foam. And we, like I said, we only make food service foam. But when you buy a TV, a refrigerator, a computer, anything like that, it comes in block foam. We take all that back and we take it out of the city, county, municipal solid, uh, municipal solid waste stream. So we take that back, we recycle it, you chop it up, um, if it needs to be rinsed, if it's dirty, people say that dirty foam isn't recyclable, it is. We just rinse it off, chop it up, melt it, put it into long strands that look like spaghetti and chop it up into beads. And then uh, we sell those beads. There's a company in Princeton, uh, New Jersey, that takes these foam beads back. And if you've ever gone to a Target or a Walmart, you will see the uh, picture frames. Those are all recycled polystyrene. If you go to, um, if you ever had a child that wanted to move and you get the red tape that you put over boxes to move your child to put on top of the boxes, 3M buys those from us and they make those red tape dispensers out of recycled polystyrene. Recycled polystyrene has one of the highest values of any recovered commodity. Uh, glass, there's no money in it. It's, it's still worthwhile to recycle, but it's a loss leader. When you go into the plastics, expanded or polystyrene, which is number six on the bottom of any cup, has a recyclable value and that is the highest cost recovered commodity. And, and, so and just I don't... Just interrupt you one second because we need to at, make sure we get time to ask you questions. Absolutely. And I, I, I'm not sure we're able to recycle them in Vermont. So how would you propose that we would recycle them should we not ban last? Sure. Um, so, um, do you know Sarah Kite up at uh, Chittenden County? She came from Rhode Island. She came from Rhode Island, Rhode Island Resource Recovery. And in Rhode Island, uh, they have a statewide uh, recycling program for polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, polystyrene number six. I would uh, urge you to reach out to her. Uh, Sarah has, uh, has been helpful. Uh, in, in the recovery and uh, recycling programs. Uh, Rhode Island is the only state that has um, a statewide um, program. And now that she's up in Chittenden County, I, I think she would be a valuable resource that you could reach out to. So uh, one of the things that um, most people don't appreciate are, are are under underappreciating is that your counties or your municipalities or whomever
takes back your recovered materials, they have the ability to work with the the, the hauler and the, and who does the recycling. And most of those folks don't want to take anything that's not in their business model because to them that's an added cost or will uh, be un, uh, eventful or not beneficial to them. They can take it back. All the city or the county has to do is when they renew their contracts is say, take back this material. So it, it can be done in California. Take it back to who? The manufacturers should take it back? We can talk about that as well. But in California, there are 66 municipalities, including Los Angeles, uh, uh, Sacramento, uh, San Diego. There, there are more facilities, more cities in, in California that allow foam to be dropped off in their uh, recovery in the blue bins that have banned it. So these cities take back foam and the foam goes back to a MRF, a material recovery facility. And at that facility, they have either, they're either hands, the, the lowest uh, grade is hand sorting, but the top grade is optical sorting. And when it goes on along the conveyor belt, it's blown off at different levels. You know, if it's light, it goes here. If it's heavier, it goes here. And so in California, more people live in cities with foam recovery than live in cities with foam bans. And, 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 and that's easily, uh, look at the Google, you know, and, 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 and that's easily provable. And, um, or I can provide it to you if you if you have any other questions. But um, okay, we need to get to final questions. Yeah, and and, and thank you for your time. And um, I um, I just live across the Connecticut River in New Hampshire, so um, I can come back anytime. And if there are any questions? And happy to do so. Thank you very much. How do I know what a styrene product is? Styrene is a liquid. And then what? Then you add, it, do you make stuff from it other than the pilot styrene, right? Yeah, uh, styrene is, um, it's a simple, simple, he's simple. Asking, I think he's asking how does yeah. the consumer know? Yeah. C8H8 is a, exactly. a styrene. It's a yeah. monomer. A polymer is a long chain of the same chemical. Right. It's organic, and and it, they they are the same, but they have different chemical properties. So nothing is really made specifically with styrene. Correct. Okay. Not nothing that's solid. Got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, you have my testimony, and, and please follow up. Thank you. Isn't styrene uh, a, um, an element that goes into polystyrene? It is, it, it's, but it's a monomer, not a polymer. It's, it's the same as, like I was going to say, uh, if you make sodium chloride salt, if you add sodium directly to water, it explodes. You add it with chlorine, it's a stable compound, and it makes salt water. Same with styrene, it, it, it won't cause health product, uh, health issues. And, and since we have been making these products for over 50 years, there's never been one health related issue ever from someone drinking coffee out of a styrene, polystyrene cup. There's more styrene in coffee than the cup. If, and, and you can go online and, and look this up yourself. I'll be happy to provide it to you. But 
there is more styrene in strawberries, beef, coffee than in a cup. So if you're going to have a leachate in a cup of coffee, it's going to go from the coffee into the cup, not the cup to the coffee. All right. All right. I'm sorry, we have to move on to our next witness. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Sheldon, members of the committee. My name is Andrew Hackman, for the record. I'm here on behalf of AmeriPen, which is the American Institute for Packaging and the Environment. Um, we are the um, organization that represents both upstream suppliers of packaging materials, the consumer goods companies like General Mills, Procter & Gamble, and some of the waste management folks like waste management. Uh, they're all members of our organization. So we seek to, to make sure that the recycling system is effective, efficient, and work collaboratively with states and, and local governments to, to help create policy solutions that will improve recycling and help move the ball forward on those issues. Uh, we're primarily here today to testify with regard to the working group. This wasn't an element that was obviously in the bill when it first was introduced and when, when it was taken for testimony on the Senate side, so we wanted to address some of the, the interest in the working group. Um, we obviously understand it's a big part of the, the eventual outcomes of this legislation from our perspective. Uh, one of the major things that we wanted to stress in terms of defining and giving an appropriate scope to the working group, group is the use of the term single use. Um, it, it's basically anybody's perception that the item is a single use product, so everything from a pencil to a disposable pen to packaging materials to other materials, given the definition that, that says if, if the end user believes that it could be discarded after one use, that potentially could make it a, a, a single use item. So we're hoping that there could be some clarity provided in the single use definition. Um, we also want to underscore that, that section six with regard to the working group. Hold on one second. Yeah, sorry. When, when folks say stuff like that, we say, great, do you have a suggestion for the definition? Yeah, I, I think in terms of, of looking at this and making it effective, if there's going to be an evaluation of the materials that are being banned under the legislation, that is, is probably a separate exercise than from looking at packaging and packaging materials for recycling. Uh, different markets, different types of products. Uh, from a packaging perspective, um, that's something that we think could be the focus. If we're going to have a discussion about packaging, it's not necessarily apples to apples with single-use items. Like, like uh, silverware and those types of things. So, um, back to, uh, to to section six and the reliance on extended producer responsibility. Uh, it's obviously very specifically called out and stipulated as an outcome that has to be evaluated. If we're going to articulate outcomes that the working group should absolutely look at, we think things like pays you throw statewide and other methodologies that can help improve consumer behavior within the system are important to, to consider. Uh, we also think that consumer education is an, effect, an essential piece for the working group to consider. Is there an effective education campaign? We, we're on the um, steering committee for recycling in the state of Washington, and uh, that's something that they're doing. They've got an active RFP out now to, to look at consumer education and how that can improve the recycling system. So we think that should at least be considered and part of the recommendations. And as it relates to extended producer responsibility, there's a lot of discussion in, in here about how to, to change manufacturer behavior. One of the aspects that we think should be considered is also the impact on the solid waste jobs in the state. Uh, when you look at mandating extended producer responsibility, you have the, the, the PRO, or the product responsibility, or product responsibility organization come in and take over collection of the materials of all of those packages and fund that via a uniform statewide contract, potentially. And that'll have an impact on whether or not certain municipalities are able to continue to offer the same amount of services. So we think, particularly if we're going to lay out specific aspects of extended producer responsibility that have to be looked at, and we should also look at the impact on solid waste jobs and how we're gonna plan and effectively deliver those services uh, in, in local communities. And then finally, in terms of the makeup of the working group, we think it's important that manufacturers have a seat at the table. Uh, and there's, a, I think, one position for a trade association, but we also think that, that folks, and particularly local manufacturers, uh, have a seat at the table in terms of, of offering perspective. But I think there are 
three positions for uh, the waste hauling community, which is certainly something we support, uh, but we think that there should also be uh, more extensive dialogue with uh, the actual manufacturers of the products as well. Uh, and I'll just note, in Connecticut, they had a, a similar study do an evaluation. They ended up not endorsing ex extended producer responsibility, um, but that might be an area to look at for the makeup of their working group. We have, I think, some folks that are testifying later on that issue, or that were members of the, the Connecticut working group, so um, they can articulate how that process worked, and, and we thought it was an effective process to really truly evaluate whether or not this is the direction we should go in. So that's the really the extent of my comments. My testimony provides more extensive discussion of some of the uh, misperceptions around extended producer responsibility, but I just wanted to offer, given time, uh, some of our key concerns. Thank you. How many manufacturers do we have in the world? Um, I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's something that, that we can pull for the committee, certainly. Other questions, committee? Okay, thank you. What did Connecticut wind up with? Uh, so they, they looked at consumer education, leveraging uh, uh, financial incentives like pay as you throw. They also talked about uh, taking better advantage of more grants uh, in terms of, there are a number, and I noted in the testimony, the Recycling Partnership and the Closed Loop Fund provide a number of grants and funding to municipalities to help improve their solid waste infrastructure and improve consumer participation in those, those efforts. But that, those efforts are entirely funded by manufacturers. So. Uh, taking advantage of things like that uh, were part of the report that the Connecticut Task Force uh, provided. Uh, how many solid waste facilities does Connecticut have? How many? Um, I, they do a lot of waste to energy. I, I can't I can say specifically how many facilities. In terms of there. landfills. Um, I, I think they don't. I don't think they ha they are currently landfilling any material. They are doing waste just, to energy. Just generally, how many landfills does the state of Connecticut? Uh, like, I don't think they are not land. I don't know how many landfills they had historical landfills, but my understanding is that they are doing all waste energy and not landfilling any of the material. Yeah, I'm just I'm just interested to know how many physical yeah. landfills there are in the state of Connecticut that are active. Okay, I, I, I can get that. No, I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, committee, we're going to um, move on Okay, committee, we're going to um, reconvene and not quite shift gears from plastics because Kathy Jameson has something to add. Right, so um, for the record, Kathy Jameson, Solid Waste Program Manager at ANR, and thank you again um, for allowing me to share a little bit more information. Um, and I apologize, I did not have this yesterday, but um, when Mr. O'Grady was doing a walkthrough, there was one part of the bill um, that was a little bit different than when it came out of Senate committee, and that is on page three, the definition of re reusable carryout bag. Oh, I don't. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so where, whoa. Can someone assist me? Where's the definition of reuse? It's right at the top of page three on the as passed by Senate. Right where you said that. Oh, okay. She gave me a different version. Okay, we'll use it as passed by Senate. Okay. Um, there's um, A, B, and C, but it's um, item number D, because A is a cloth bag, B is a, a non woven bag, C is the durable plastic bag. D is made of paper or other material that is not plastic, has handles in a thickness of 2.25 mils or more. If you look at that, as well as number nine, the single-use paper bag, um, the single-use paper bag means a carryout bag made of paper or other material that is not plastic and has a thickness less than 2.25 mils. Now, so there, they're trying, the D was added on the floor, and I have, I asked staff to look into where would paper bags fall generally? Would they fall in the, re, the reusable carryout bag due to their thickness, or would they fall into um, the single-use carryout bag? And in general, um, virtually 
all the paper bags that are out there in the market fall in would fall into the reusable paper bag as defined in the bill, which would mean that you wouldn't have paper bags that would be subject to the five cent fee. So, you know, it's it would be the way it's written a little confusing to implement because people wouldn't know do we charge, do we not charge, when in essence the way it's written most if not all paper bags would not be subject to the fee. And I wanted to bring that to your attention because that would be an implementation issue. And it's certainly, you know, the committee's decision on how you want to, you know, do you want to charge for the paper, do you not? But, but the way it's written, virtually all paper would not be subject to the fee. And Great. I just wanted to bring that to your Thank attention. Thank you for catching right. that. And then, and then that number nine, you know, is the definition of a paper bag says paper or other materials. That's a little confusing. Because a paper bag, you would think would be paper. <laughs> so again, that's up to you folks to define. Um, yeah. But that's it. Just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. That's very helpful. Any follow-up? Representative mm -hmm. um, um, Yes. I, I apologize. I don't get it. <laughs> um, so D made a paper or other material you're, you're, so I need to know you're liking that or not liking that well or one, you one option suggest? for the committee to consider yeah. and again this is your yeah. choice is, yeah. is to instead of made of strike paper or so it would say made of other material that is not plastic and insert or paper would be an edit that you know, if you choose to go down that route and you would do that if you would want the paper bags to be subject to the five cents. That is not plastic or paper. That way, there, there could be other materials that are not captured by A, B, and C okay. that are durable, that are thick, that could be used for a bag. And the 2.25 mils is good there. Then, in, in, in specifically in nine, single-use paper carryout bag means um, no, single use carry out bag. Paper. Paper carry out bag. You're good with that? Well, no. It, it says made of paper or other materials. Do you want a paper bag to be paper made of other or other material? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you, you might want to end that paper. Yeah. This paper. Yeah. <laughs> and strike the, the rest. Well, Okay, good. That helps me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Laura, any update on the Do you have to have 3.1 in front of you? We do. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, oh, I think I left my annotated copy downstairs, but um, you can go to page 13, I believe. Um, that's where the first just, uh, change was made. It was a typo. It removes significant between make and decisions. 
And then on page 14, line three, there's another typo, changing natural resource conservation district to the plural. Mm -hmm. Then I think you can skip to line, uh, page 26. Um, this is the uh, percentage provision um, for the awards to the water quality enhancement grants. So in that first priority of recommendations that the Clean Water Board is making from the Clean Water Fund, they will, for the water quality enhancement grants under section 926 of this title, uh, a, make a recommendation at a funding level of at least 25% of the annual balance of the Clean Water Fund, provided that the maximum amount recommended shall not exceed $5 million. Shall I move on? Uh, there's a typo on page 32, line 11. It had said recommend opportunities, so the recommended framework shall include recommended opportunities to leverage federal and other non-state funds for conservation projects. And then on page 34, as part of the Clean Water Investment Report, so this entire section 10 on page 33 going on to page 34 is new. The beginning January 2023, uh, a summary of the administration, the report shall include a summary of the administration of the grant programs established under sections 925 to 928 of Title 10, including whether these grant programs are adequately funding implementation of the Clean Water Initiative and whether the funding limits for the water quality enhancement grants should be amended to improve state implementation of the Clean Water Initiative. That's it. What do you mean by ag program dollars? Well, I was looking for the chart. I couldn't find it this morning, but when we had the Agency of Agriculture came in, they were showing, you know, what their dollars were uh, that they were putting into water quality projects. And uh, I'm just wondering that, if I remember correctly, it was around $6 million, maybe. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I was wondering if, if Part of that 20, 25% came out of those dollars. If that was included in the calculation to come up with the 25%. Carrie? I have um, Carrie Hunt State Fiscal Year 20 Governor's Budget dated January 24, 2019. And it shows for the Clean Water Funds only that agriculture receives somewhere in the order of 3.385 million. And so, although this would apply, this calculus applies to the entire Clean Water Fund to make sure that there's adequate funding statewide, including uh, those partners such as conservation districts or watershed groups working with farmers outside Lake Champlain, uh, making those funds available. So there's still plenty of money, and the money that is under, for fiscal year 20 in particular is uh, still available for agricultural use with the Lake Champlain. So we haven't reduced their dollars with this calculation? Uh, nope, they still have access to that 3.385. And that, that's where my concern, you know, come from. I just, uh, I know that uh, agriculture produces around 40% of the phosphorus load and being asked to clean up 60% of it. I want to make sure that the hands weren't being tied with reducing the funding. Now this this ensures that there's adequate funding available statewide, including agricultural needs that, that flow through partners for the rest of the state. 
but it's simply to determine what would be a floor um, for agricultural, uh, excuse me, a floor for that one of those four funding options, the uh, enhancement grant option. Okay, and what about the municipal funding? Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the fourth item there under the municipal. Well, the, there's funds uh, for clean water activities, you know, for uh, reducing the cost of from the road entries and whatever else, you know, is going on. Harvey, can you make sure you speak up with this loud machinery? Well, I'm just trying to understand. <coughs> I'm asking now about the municipal funding part and uh, whether they're uh, going to have a seal reduction as well. I'm concerned about both the agriculture and the municipal programs and want to make sure that there was adequate funds to uh, reach the targets that they were set for. That's what my question is. I, I just want some clarification because it looked to me like the 25% of those funds were going to siphon some of those dollars off. I could be wrong. I could be looking at it wrong. I couldn't find a chart. Well, the municipalities can apply for these water costs can apply for money from this $5 million, right? Okay. Um, plus they're getting, uh, they're, some of them are gonna get money under the Water Quality Restoration Formula Grant and the project's funded under that. And then there's the two other municipal stormwater programs, the grant programs that are created on page two, I mean on page 27 and page 28. Um, so I see that it's a representative from the Agency of Agriculture here. Could, could we hear from her just to see what her thoughts are? You can see the facts of the budget. Sure. Um, so currently, for the record, Laura DiPietro, Agency of Agriculture, for the FY20 budget, there's, I'm going to round numbers, right? There's 48 million in the Clean Water Fund, and the Agency of Ag is, and BHCB, so Ag as a whole, is um, about 10 million. So that's currently structured how it is. Um, last year, it was about 58 million, and Ag was about 9.7 million. In the Clean Water Fund? Mm -hmm. the whole 48 million. million in the fund? No, so she's including capital dollars. Yep. Well, the capital dollars are not in the fund. They're not in this calculus. Okay, I can look at that separately, but that's what the, when the board makes the decision and looks at the whole budget, that's what they're looking at is the big picture there. Right, but the right, institutions yesterday is discussing whether they need to assert more control over those capital dollars. And if I may? Yeah. Um, capital funds have been historically used for since clean and clear days under the Douglas administration to support agricultural best management practices and other clean water funding. And, and I know that that's within the context of the, uh, the jurisdiction of the House Institu Corrections Institutions Committee. And as you know, in the last couple of years ago, when there was a, a significant um, bump up of capital dollars, that's when she turned to um, seek assistance for the clean water fund. Um, but I think their engagement and their involvement is critical to continue to support agriculture. What we're talking about solely is about the clean water fund itself, not the capital. Right. Uh, Representative McCullough, I've seen this. So, questioning um, um, Laura um, further. Laura, I'm thinking that the water quality enhancement grants actually also serve uh, farmers um, and through through like uh, the Vermont Association of Conservation Districts and others. Is, is that accurate? So currently as my understanding of how S96 is drafted and the intent is that the, the challenge with agricultural projects is that the way the RAPs are written just for simplification is that we can actually require any project. So there is no bright line between what is regulatory and what is non-regulatory. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, as Harvey had, sorry, Representative Smith had outlined, um, ag is 40% of the, the load going in, but 67% of the reduction. So 
in order to do more than what you're contributing, we're going to have to tell people to do projects that are above and beyond so that they can achieve those additional reductions. Mm -hmm. And so because there is no bright line, ag is not part of the allocation going through this restoration grant program concept. Um, the intent is that agriculture will still be managed as it is today, which is those budgets come to the agency, we move them to partners like the ACD or other groups, and they do that work. And the accountability comes up through us and goes into the DEC reporting system. So nothing should effectively change in that space. I think the question just being raised is, would that have an impact on the Clean Water Fund budget that is currently coming to the agency for those purposes? Yeah, but that was not my question to you, actually. So my question to you, uh, I'll, I'll restate it, that the water quality enhancement grants also fund agricultural projects typically statewide. Not. Um, typically, DEC district. has managed those grants. Yeah. And at the time when the Clean Water Fund really became a good fund, we made the distinction that ag projects should go to the agency of ag and all other projects should go to DEC. So that way we weren't having, we had these grant committees that would work together and, and make sure that there was a separation. But DEC has plenty of other projects to fund. And so all the agricultural stuff was directed to the agency of agriculture. So, so the conservation districts then are not funding um, conservation projects um, for farmers They are doing others. it through grants that the agency of agriculture provides to them um, so essentially, DC and AC Bag both have clean water grant fund programs. And so it's just a different pathway where they apply to us and we issue the grants to them versus DC. So yes, they do provide funding and it is leveraged funding to farmers statewide. Through the agency of agriculture. Well, wonderful. But the, the bottom line is, for me, water quality enhancement grants can and does include funding um, to agricultural projects statewide. It, there's, there's a separation that that, if, I, if I'm understanding how this is set up in the conversation, that is particularly specific to DEC's water quality restoration grant, which is different than the money that is carved off for the agency of ag to then run our own version of that same program. So we would not want to um, exclude uh, the conservation districts, uh, the conservation uh, partners from giving money to the agency of agriculture and the farmers. We wouldn't want to do that, would we? Well, that's why I think it's important in the conversation and the question that um, Representative Smith asks is 25% of what, right? If it's 25% if it's of what already is attributed to DEC and the grant programs there, it's very different than 25% of the whole and then carving off the agency of ag. So understanding what it's 25% of. I'm going to say thank you. I can say um, There's a representative from the conservation districts here. Would you like to speak? Sure. Jill Arachi, Vermont Association of Conservation Districts. So the majority of conservation districts for agricultural work comes through the agency of agriculture and the um, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. We do receive a little bit of funding from DEC. I honestly don't know which fund it comes from to supplement technical assistance. So through the Ag Water Quality Partnership, um, you know, the agencies sit together and say, what can we do, especially to get NRCS dollars on the ground? Where's there a gap? And the agencies kind of collaborate to decide how to fill those gaps. So we have had grants from DEC um, for technical assistance positions um, associated um, with agriculture, not so much for specific projects on the um, but to get NRCS or Agency of Ag funded, capital funded projects on the ground. The other kinds of programs that conservation districts do um, with DEC funding is both stormwater projects and natural resource projects, um, buffer plantings, green stormwater infrastructure projects, basin planning, project development. That answers some questions. And may I follow up with a question? Oh, yeah. Actually. But, but, um, but I do understand that some of those natural resource projects, whether it's berm removal or natural resource restoration, 
may occur in partnership with the uh, with the producer, with the farmer. Absolutely. So and they can occur outside Lake Champlain Basin. And yes. in fact, I know in down in Bennington County, uh, there's been some very successful projects run through the conservation districts that rely on DEC funding, not necessarily the Agency of Agriculture's Absolutely. Funding. Pretty much all, most of our trees for streams, plant repairing and buffer plantings, is funded by DEC or the Lake Champlain Basin Program. We're actually working with a private company that's selling ecosystem services and paying us to plant trees on behalf of companies. So we have this collage um, of projects. We make sure that the, if we're working with a farmer, that they've looked into the CREP program, they're either implementing the CREP program, that's kind of one of the requirements to make sure we're leveraging federal funds first. The, I, I want to make one more point about the, um, whatever, I don't know what we're calling it now, but the non-regulatory funding. So we're all talking about ecosystem services and um, nutrient trading, and that happens in the non-regulatory world. So we actually are going to need more funding. We're going to incentivize landowners to go above and beyond the minimum RAP requirements and to be able to treat um, the benefits they provide. So I'm talking about, you know, longer term funding for um, cover crop implementation, for example. I know we tell some of the things that aren't within the current um, NRCS or agency system. So we would like to see the opportunity to utilize some of that um, discretionary funding for ecosystem services. That's where the training is going to happen. I believe the agency hopes so too. That's cost effective. Yeah, and if I may follow up, I mean, that's fundamentally about Lake Champlain. We're talking about the value of having funding available outside Lake Champlain and then for Magog at an adequate funding level to address a suite of needs, whether it's a municipality applying for funds, whether it's a conservation district working with a farmer. Uh, these are funding, funding needs outside of Lake Champlain and, and the funds that Agency of Agriculture manages. Is there a need for that, an uh, adequate funding level? And what's being proposed here, does that meet that demand? I, if, I'm not sure what the answer is, because I'm too not clear on we're talking about 25% of the 40%? Right now it's 25%. Okay, 25% of the whole Clean Water Fund, or 25% of the Clean Water Fund up to? 40%. That's where I get more sheep. Up to a cap. 25%. Of the clean water, water fund, fund up, to, up to a cap of five million. Uh, I, I think it depends how it's split between this, uh, what's considered regulatory and non-regulatory. Uh, um, if we're talking about non-regulatory, non we would definitely like to see expanded funding. Um, One point five certainly wasn't enough, and um, we there, not just conservation district watershed groups do extensive work in watersheds besides Lake Champlain and Mayfair Magog, but also work in Lake Champlain and Mayfair Magog that might not be qualify as high phosphorus reduction projects. They may have other very important benefits. So we want both types of projects. Perfect. So my question, you know, it's on the same line. I just want clarity as to what we're taking that 25% from. Is it are the regulatory programs outside of this funding pot we're talking about? So the agents of agriculture and the municipalities are not going to be affected uh, by this 25%? Uh, I can answer that. I put a spreadsheet together and I show that the funding that let's just look at fiscal year 20 where there's anticipated, assuming we fill the hole of 8 million, there's anticipated to have 15 million available through the Clean Water Fund. The agency agriculture's use of Clean Water Fund, not capital, is on the order of 3.4 million. And the 25% of 15 arrives at 3.75. So there's enough money in there to serve the purposes of meeting the agency of agriculture's demand for Clean Water Fund funding, as well as this um, funding available for that enhancement okay, so grant. I'm, I'm still not clear. We have a, a regulated funding and non-regulated funding. And I'm asking, is it just coming out of the non-regulatory program funding that we're doing that 25% or is it the total water quality funded package that we're doing 25%. That's my question. 
What do you mean by the regulatory funding? Well, we, we, we've been talking about the, uh, in, in agriculture we have, uh, you know, the, that's our regulatory program, where they have to meet, you know, all those requirements of the IRA piece, and, you know, they've got to be required to put in some best management practices, those kind of things. So I look at that as one pot of money, and then I thought another pot of money was for the non-regulatory program that goes to the conservation districts and all the things that we've been talking about. So, okay. So all of the agency's budget to run the programs, MFO, LFO, small farm, RAPs, that goes through the agency's budget. Mm -hmm. So that part of the regulatory component of it is, is not in the clean water fund or contemplated by this language at all. The next part of it, what you were saying, the BMPs, the RAPs, equip, et cetera, that's wholly within the capital appropriations that go to the agency from the capital bill. Now, people are saying that's the clean water fund. That is not the clean water fund. That's what I'm trying right? to understand. <laughs> so so those, those capital dollars are recommended for use by the clean water board but they are not deposited in the clean water fund. The only money that goes into the clean water fund today is the property transfer surcharge and the sheets, which will start in January of 2020. From that money, that's what the priorities on page 26 are about. And ag programs are of equal priority under that in the four five main um, funding provisions under that, except that that these enhancement grants are going to have a, a minimum of 25% slash $5 million. So as an example, say that the clean water fund, the property transfer tax surcharge, and the sheets, and whatever else the General Assembly puts in there is $10 million next year. And all of the capital money that the agency of ag usually gets is under the capital bill for its regulatory programs and, and for whatever it uses that capital money for. There's $10 million in the clean water fund. 2.5 million will go to the enhancement grant. Then there will be 500,000 that's gonna go to the water basin planning, right? So there's $7 million left for the clean water board to recommend for those other three programs and just say that they allocate that equally you're going to get like 2.5 million dollars mm -hmm. per pack well that's the best explanation i've heard yet <laughs> so thank you for the clarity now the what the what's going to happen in 2023 mm -hmm is that there's going to be clean water service providers and they're going to get a formula grant award each year which could impact what goes out to those other two programs that are not the enhancement grant and not the basin planning but hopefully at that time the amount of money in the clean water fund will be greater than 10 million dollars so that the agency of ag won't be negatively affected and potentially could actually be positively affected. Okay. Then I have one follow-up question. Sure. We had this discussion yesterday. The agency sounded like they had some concerns mm -hmm. over what it is. Could, could we get an explanation of what their concerns are? I don't know. I'd be, I'd be happy to provide the concerns and sort of the record match app in the General Counsel Agency of Natural Resources. I mean, I, I agree with everything Mike just went through. I think the concern is as we um, sort of go through the program process, if there's a $5 million allocation of budget funds to um, enhancement projects, um, we think that we need that money just to meet our obligations pursuant to the TMDL. Um, that these additional good projects that need to take place um, are coming out of 
uh, a set of budget and funding recommendations that were developed in order to meet the obligations under the TMDLs that we have. So as a result of that, it's our belief that there will not be enough money in the Clean Water Fund to both accomplish the TMDL objectives and do the enhancement grants. I would just say that as a result of that, based on both how the TMDL is structured, as well as sort of the general guidance that the agency uses in making decisions with respect to this, um, and the way the statute is structured, that the first place we would take money from is the municipal grant program. It's in a lower tier, and it's a regulatory program that has to happen regardless of that. So that that is both from a legislative policy perspective and from a TMDL implementation perspective, the first place we would take money from. Right, the people that are going to get affected negatively is the second tier, second priority. <clears throat> Remind us who else is in the second tier. Um, well, it begins on page 26 going on to page 27. <clears throat> it's funding for programs or projects that address or repair riparian conditions, funding for education and outreach regarding implementation of water quality requirements, funding for the municipal stormwater assistance grant, which is all the, the permits that you want to fund, uh, funding for innovative or alternative technologies for um, improved water quality from nutrient removal technologies, funding to purchase ag land in order to take it out of practice for, um, and then on page 28, line 18, the develop plans and implementation grant program. So a lot, it seems to me that some of these um, funding programs that address or repair riparian conditions, that, that those would fall under the enhancement grants, that kind of project would be there. Um, another one struck me as saying, well, taking ag land out of production, I would think would also fall either potentially under the restoration grant or the enhancement grant. Or capital dollars. Or capital dollars. So there's all this crossover among these priorities mm -hmm. that is perhaps one of our points of confusion. Carrie. Uh, and, and keep in mind, I mean, that's why the objective here is to raise enough of an adequate funding level to be able to support these funding programs and, and improve water quality. We're looking the order of 50 to 60 million is described in here. Raise them up to meet our needs. So originally, the administration was looking at 1.5 million as opposed to what we've got in there now at five. Yes, uh, and uh, Well, we don't uh, have five. We've well, got 3.7 under 25% of the current. We well, you know it's on the bill. What's in the bill is 25%, which would be about three, three something. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to get at in terms of uh, uh, would, it, would it improve your, I guess, zone of comfort if, with a, with a review period at some point to see how far we're going along that line, wouldn't you be able to tell within three years whether or not this, this the way the bill was written now would detract from your ability to fund both uh, the other projects that you're afraid you're gonna lose out on, especially I'm concerned particularly about the municipalities. I mean, how much time do you need in order to make that kind of estimate? Or would you recommend? Well, again, I, I think from the agency's perspective, the, you know, the budget that's been provided, the 60 million is what the it's basically half of what the treasurer recommends to meet the targets in the Lake Champlain Basin. And we've made the statement that we think we can stretch that money and have it applied to, to Magog, and we were comfortable <coughs> stretching it to have up to 1.5 million. I think the agency is fairly confident that if the money goes up to 5 million, that it's going to divert from our efforts to meet our obligations in Lake Champlain and Lake Memphis. But I guess I think what Representative Fayes is getting at, which was the solution we tried to come up with yesterday, all the stuff is not ramping up for three to five years, realistically. So why not, in the interim, try this out 
And then when we're ready to go with these clean water service providers, we'll have a much better sense of it all. Is that, I mean, that, that's kind of where we're trying to head. That's right. So, I mean, I think the way. We're not ready to spend the money with the clean water service providers, so. No, I, but again, I think it goes back to where where's the focus of where we're spending the money. And, and part of our primary objective was to try and transition the focus towards projects that have a demonstrable phosphorus or pollution reduction allocation associated with them. And we need to do that as quickly as possible in order to meet our obligations under the TMDL. But, but I agree. I mean, there is a, there is a phase up associated with this. I mean, I mean, the agency has, is proposing this because they don't have the capacity to get money out the door to specific projects. And right now, we do have, I mean, we have an inventory of good projects across the state which allow us to continue investing in those until we figure out the, we, we bought into the system sure, idea sure. that we need to prioritize our sick child, got that, <laughs> but we have other children with needs. And in the meantime, while, while the emergency room is figuring out how to move forward, right. why not? So to be clear, I don't think we have any, I think that we have every intention of giving all the children some a portion of the money with respect to this. I think the concern is with the, the, budgetary, the budgetary minimums associated with it, um, it's going to take away from our ability to, to deal with the child in the emergency room. Um, and that we have concerns about the budgetary minimums associated with what is in there. Okay, but I'm going to go back to the timeline question which we brought up yesterday. The funds get created upon passage. Do the funds get created upon passage? What? The funds? Funds, the four buckets that we're talking about. Oh, uh, yeah, everything gets created on July 1, 2019. Well, except the stuff that's phasing in. And so I'm just saying, like, if these funds and our recommendations actually are going to exist separate from the clean water service provider infrastructure, I'm, I'm getting kind of more convinced that it's in these, in these ramp up years, or whatever we're going to call them, that we continue to prioritize the enhancement. So with respect to the ramp up years, I actually, I think, at least it's the agency's view, that that is handled in the context of the transition section. And it specifically addresses during the ramp up that we do the best that we can to maintain the status quo between the time, between the present and the time that um, the service delivery providers are put into effect. And then once the service pro delivery providers are come into being, there's basically an analysis where we're trying to provide geographic distribution of these funds so that areas outside of, let's say, the Chittenden or Mifromagog basins are see receiving a perhaps greater weight in the grant review process. So I mean, I, I think the concern, again, comes from the numeric budgetary numbers, minimums, that are in uh, the priority session, section. Um, not the concept that we would be maintaining the status quo during the ramp up, or at least generally the status quo during the ramp up, that we wouldn't make significant shifts. Okay. And you don't like the 25%? Correct. Yes. What did you just say about the 25%? The agency doesn't like the 25%. Well, I was just going to throw out 20%, see if that was something that would be acceptable. 20% and then keep the rest in place, up to 5 million with a re reassessment yeah. in whatever year. Beginning January 2023. Yeah. 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 What do folks think? Trevor. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about the testimony and concerns of the agency, and I would support that. <clears throat> I'll support the 20%. So 20%, I think, gets us to $3 million in this, in the, in the fiscal year 20 budget, 15. And leave the $5 million. With a reassessment in 2023 in the clean water or in the reporting mechanism that Michael presented today. How do folks, go ahead. Uh, I 
can support that um, in recognition that there's still a significant lift in maintaining and enhancing water quality outside Lake Champlain Basin and for Mega. Remember, that's 45% of land mass of the state. So I, I will support that. Representative McCullough. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think what the room, from my perspective, is really failing to get is that we're not just saying we're going to snatch $5 million out. That's the ceiling. And that forgetting the idea that it's a percentage of what's there, it and as a percentage, as as the dollars increase in the pot, they they increase for everybody, <laughs> and and that I think that concept is being lost, and. I, I think the concept is being lost that, that when that happens, there won't be um, um, heart palpitations in the other areas, and the munis will not be suffering, and agriculture will not be suffering as a result of this. Um, so I, I'd like to leave it at 25%, but I, I um, can support 20%, leaving everything else the same, um, with a tear on my cheek. And Harvey, I appreciate your moving this forward with a, with a constructive idea. Thank you. Others? So I'm, I'm along with Jim. I'd like to keep it at 25%. I've been in Vermont long enough to know what goes on down south which is kind of frustrating. But again, I would have to go to Jim and just say I would support the 20%. Okay. Um, so I would like to see happen is more money in the pot. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. critical. And as Jim said- More money from pot? That's happening. <laughs> 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 We needed that much. I guess I'll look I agree. I, I'm, the twenty percent seems to be seeing as though it's going to come around again another three years. <laughs> what we're doing, I, I think that's a good place to start. So I would go along with Harvey's uh, recommendation of twenty percent. Okay. Um, let's just, that's sounding like we're getting committee consensus on this, that's fabulous, I, I'm with you all. Um, I would like to go back to the definition of administrative costs and talk about how that percolates through with some of the other changes I know this we have made, but we, we sort of breeze through the definition, um, and I just want to understand, be sure I understand how that will play through um, where the line for project implementation gets drawn and the directives in here to the agency to help provide guidance for that. So page one. Uh, I, when you ask for a definition, you ask me to look at the municipal roads grant and aid program. I couldn't find anything. Uh, on an agency website or an RPC website that define it, I emailed Peter Gregory because I just know him and have a relationship with him. Um, and he uh, emailed back and basically gave me this as a definition with the caveat that it, he didn't have the exact definition from the agency in front of him, um, but he thought this was pretty close to what it is. Okay, and then let's go to the section on um, providing guidance. Because that's where the guidance for the administrative costs comes into play. I think that's it. 
Monitoring referring to project monitoring. That's what we name on line 15, page one. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify. You want me to say project monitoring? For inspection? Uh, I'm not sure. But I just, no, you can leave it at that. But I just want to make sure we struggle with that term monitoring and why we added verification and and what was the other term? So I, I just thought that. Well, should I change it or not? I'm not sure. I'm sure, sure. Or, um, so would they, would it, yeah, I just am wondering if limiting it constrains it. So with are there other things that would be monitored, like the, um, I don't know, efficacy of, that's why we added, remember we kept adding the term verification, verification right. to it uh, as a, a, a better inspection verification we added to them all mm -hmm. as opposed to the term monitoring. So just adding, you could say inspection verification. So well, let's just go to where it's used and that's going to help us know if it's a good definition. So. Take us to where? Page 10. Uh, well, page 10 is where the guidance is. Mm -hmm. That's what you wanted, right? Yeah. Well, I guess if there's other places. Um, so, page 10, line 6, and carrying out its duties, a provider shall adopt guidance for subgrants consistent with guidance from A&R that establishes a policy of how the provider will issue subgrants, um, giving due consideration to the expertise of those organizations and other requirements for administration. The subgrant guidance shall include how the clean water service provider will allocate administrative costs to subgrantees for project implementation for the administrative costs of Basin Water Quality Council. And on page nine, A and R issues guidance on requirements associated with the distribution of the administrative costs to clean water service providers and subgrantees. So we, we keep talking about when the when the funds get bigger, and I feel like one of the things that we we've, we've bought into here is this idea that we're getting some level of efficiency by not doing this at the state level through DEC. And so if you get one million your first time you're a clean water service provider, that's 150,000, but presumably doing the same amount of administrative work as as the budgets go up, they're just going to get more money. And I'm not sure how we're ensuring that we're getting um, efficient use of that money. Right, so they, if, a, but if a clean water service provider gets a million the first time, but then they get three million, arguably their administrative costs shouldn't have gone up that much. Charlie? Sorry. <laughs> I thought you might be able to help us. <laughs> uh, Charlie Baker, uh, Executive Director of the Jim County Regional Planning Commission. I'm here on behalf of all the RPC statewide. But if, um, to, to respond to that, sorry, if we're getting three million, that means there's three million dollars of projects happening. And so that 15% is also probably going to partners to help get that project done. So it's not, it doesn't stay with, from my understanding, with the clean water service provider. It's to be shared with who's managing the project. Yes, and you've connected my dots back to our definition of administrative cost, which doesn't include project implementation. And so that's the crux of this conversation. So the, and, and, uh, sorry to, uh, ahead, yeah. I, I think the words that were in that, I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me, but the words that were in that, uh, we're around, I also thought, project management. Um, and if it's not there, then that, that kind of idea needs to be there. Yes. That's what I was checking on, and I think it needs to be added. And I just want to make sure that the folks agree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what that's I, I appreciate on page one is to manage a project requires all these things. That's, so we have a little bit more information, but you could say project management or delivery, including, and then listing these things on the definition. And, and sorry, to add to that a little bit more, there's really two levels of administration going on. 
right? There's, yeah. There is a project management, but then there is also the entirety of the program in that watershed. So the monitoring may not be just the project monitoring, it's also how are we doing on meeting our pollution reduction goal That's for the entire base? Why I didn't want to limit it. Yeah, I, I think that was well thought <laughs> to not limit it because there is the two level of administration going. So just as you're thinking about it, create the space for that 15% to be used yeah. for program and project. Yeah. I want to be sure that that project implementation, that we're clear that project completion is part of those administrative costs. Yes, Lynn. So the way that they do it right, so the DEC manages it right now. Oh, sorry. The way that, oh, again, oh, Lynn, Mo, sorry. Lynn Mono, Watersheds United, Director of Watersheds United, Vermont. So the way that DEC does it right now is they have what they call program delivery, which is what you guys are calling administrative. And that's really to do all of that oversight and grant management. And then the project management, which is often really dealing with the implementation portion, that's, that's part of those implementation dollars that are given out. So I guess I would recommend not having project management, which is really over, you know, that, that's really that sort of critical role that those folks are playing on the ground doing the work. That's part of those, those dollars that are project dollars. And usually the way it works is those program delivery funds are split. If there's a block grant, those program delivery funds are split between the, the, the recipient of the block grant, in this case it would be the clean water service provider, and the folks who are actually receiving the money because they're the ones having to report back up to that clean water service provider. So I guess I would recommend keeping project management, which is really implementation work, separate from the program delivery or administration and just making sure that that program delivery funds get split between the clean water service provider and then whoever it is that's actually doing the on-the-ground project. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> it does make sense. It, it makes sense, sense. Do now. It makes sense, but then I'm questioning 15%. I don't know. I mean, I, I wonder um, about that number. It, I think it's 10%. It used to be 10%. 10% uh, of the black grant was 15 on the grant date, and if I may, um, it's project delivery, which is the administration cost of the project. And that includes, that 50% is to include both the administration of the service provider's work, as well as the amount of pass-through to help manage the project, the projects. So, um, and as funding increases, I envision that the service provider's cost would probably only increase nominally. It's really uh, the, the more projects will be funded for on the ground implementation. So again, I think that 15% is adequate. We, the reason why there's two, um, where we started at 10% with the block grant and moved to 15% of the grant aid is 10% is just not enough to fully support the level of project implementation and tracking. Uh, it was 10% of the overall cost. I understand, but 10% of a million dollars. I mean, at some point, you should get economies of scale as your ramp up. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. I suppose you could say no more than 15%, but I still don't think that's enough protection somehow. I'm clueless on what the percentage ought to be, but I, I'm thinking I understand what Charlie is talking about. What he was talking about? Charlie oh, basically um, was talking about it needs to be, I, I think, parsed out um, maybe in the language. Most certainly, um, I would agree that um, if you got X amount of dollars takes X amount of administrative costs in the building to handle those. And if you've got X times five, economy of scale is still there in the building, um, if you will, the building of the office, the, the strictly paper moving and, and telephone 
uh, electric lights and everything that goes into um, what I would also call overhead, which may be a synonym to this, but as you get more dollars, you've got more projects. And then the administrative costs, as a general contractor, if you will, thinking in the construction industry, those administration costs go way up because you gotta be even in the field checking on your project supervisors to make sure they are performing as expected. So then administrative um, costs do go up and there isn't a, econ an economy of scale there. 15% um, may still be an okay number um, but I think if I think I think I understood um, that we need to parse out those two types of administrative costs. Am I accurate? Or, or just make sure they're both eligible under that? Yes. From our perspective, 15% was adequate to cover both levels, mm -hmm. but and, and sharing with the partners to right. administer the projects. So, but you would have, and, and I thought I heard you recommending in the definition on page one, and, and, and you may need to have that in front of you, right? You didn't have it before. Um, to parse that out somewhat. Or, or just, yeah, I, th I thought you were talking about listing, you know, program and project management. Yeah. Or, or yeah. Whether by common or not. Okay. Yeah. All right. Don't you lose your copy. Good. Thank you. I don't have any. I feel like that was two different statements, though. So you're, you're saying program and project management could be an administrative cost. And really, though, what that means is um, sharing that money with partners who are implementing projects. On Which the is ground. defined elsewhere in the bill right now. Okay. cost means incurred by a clean water service provider or a grantee uh, to support program and project management including you know, to conduct procurement contract preparation again, so to support so program and project to support program and project management including and then you can have this list and, and keep in mind, I mean, we're talking about the, the, our water quality problems, our accumulation of a lot of little problems everywhere, and each of those little problems has a project assigned to it and takes time to work with that landowner and get that project implemented according to design. So it's, I think it's adequate for the purposes of trying to support both the service provider and the work itself. Two questions, one for, for Michael and the other for the chair. Um, Michael, you, have you seen any clear direction around um, changes to uh, administrative cost definition? Um, or have an idea that is born out of what you've heard and, and what you know? Well, I have a couple of ideas. They're not real different from what Representative Dole just said. Um, you could say administrative costs means program and project costs, project management costs incurred by a clean water service provider or grantee, comma, including to conduct procurement, contract preparation, etc. Or you could say something like administrative cost means the cost incurred by a clean water service provider or grantee to implement and administer a program and project, comma, including to conduct something. First one was nice and clean. Yeah, yeah. first one was clean. Better. Yeah. Couldn't hear all of the second one. The windows are open, so we have oxygen, but I think it's also really. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I'm, I'm normally not accused of being I know. I was, that's, I, that's, 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 and that's the first time I couldn't hear you. I didn't say anything because I, I understand. I usually do hear you, but I think it's just lots of deliveries. So, so thank you, Michael. And it sounds like with some head nodding, your, your first one what might be the committee's choice. Um, that isn't my call to make, but I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. And, and I'm, I guess I'm going to say, considering that and the 25% to 20%, I'm thinking we are at the threshold of a vote to yeah. pass this bill out of committee. And so that's the question for the chair. Can we do that today? And uh, uh, this is a procedural question. We can do that today. I'd like to. Can Representative Odie then Terenzini. Is there any harm in saying not greater than 15% taking into account a chance for economy of scale? Because if we say 15%, then it has to be 15%. So what, what is the harm of saying not oh, more than It already does. Yeah, somewhere it does, but where oh. else? Sorry. Yeah. Um, there you go. Just double check. Where is that? Uh, page 16, not more than 15% of the total grant amount awarded shall be used for administrative costs. Well, that's myself. <laughs> it's always good to find that out. <laughs> Representative Terenzini. Yeah, I'm sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, I want to ask uh, Matt Chapman, uh, with this bill being passed, uh, is that more, more jobs for uh, A&R? I mean, you have to hire more people? You know, I, based on our initial review of this, we don't think that we're going to have to hire additional staff. Carrie, uh, what about your department? Well, I'm no longer uh, in this program, so um, I would defer to Matt Chapman to be able oh, to Oh, you're going to be de DEC? Yeah, but, but I'm not in managing the Clean Water Initiative. Again, I, I, with respect to our initial review of this, we don't see there being a need to add additional staff. In. Laura, what about the uh, ag? Any new positions because of this bill? Uh, it shouldn't change for us at this point. Okay. Thank you. Okay, committee. So I think with a couple of changes, this draft is um, <clears throat> for folks feeling comfortable with where we're heading with this bill. Can we make a motion assuming those two are distance? Yes, we can. Well, I would, I would make a motion that, that we, or at least a vote for this bill based on um, Council O'Grady's first change to administrative cost and changing the percent associated with the, uh, the enhancement grants at the 20 Yes. Representative Dolan. Yes. Representative Faye. Yes. Representative McCullough. Yes. Representative Morgan. Yes. Representative Odie. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. Representative Squirrel. Yes. Representative Terenzini. No. Representative Shelton. Yes. Thank you all for persevering. And the vote was nine. And um, putting your minds into it, everybody did. Thank you. We will just go from here. Um, from here, it will go to the floor and then go to Ways and Means because it had underlying funding in it, and we will uh, go there hopefully to get more to get the funding put back into it. We we'll also have to go to appropriations, I think. Okay. So. So it will go to, will go to the floor before we we'll go to Ways and Means. Ways and Means. To be sent to ways and maintenance, yeah. I see. That's how it Who happens. retains jurisdiction? Uh, we're giving it up. It'll go to ways and means. It'll get jurisdiction. By rule, because the bill, S96, as it was introduced, included a B structure in it, it will go. So, 
how it works. And then by rule, after it comes out of ways and means, it'll go to appropriations, probably most specifically because of that 20% $5 million. Will you keep this three dot one? Uh, if you want me to, I'll just change the timestamp and the extent. All right, great. Um, will you have time to make those changes? I hope maybe now, because you were booked with us till noon. Sure. <laughs> great. All right. Thank you.